done. My presentation, my presentation is like two minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna just sit right here. Oh, that's fine. Sir.
Good morning. Please stand for the opening hymn found in your United Methodist Hymnal 277, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. Can I call Ryan to light the candle? Please join me in the call to worship. God is alive in every stage of life. God calls and guides every step of the way. From the joyful innocence of childhood. To the wishful dreaming of young years. From the persistent hopes of the middle age. So let us each be open to God in these moments. Please join me in the opening prayer. God, we have not known how to use the gifts you have given us. At times we have misused and abused your gifts, not knowing how to use them in a world where homelessness, pain, disease, injustices, and death affect young and old. We continue to build bigger homes, drive fancier cars, and wear fine clothes at the expense of those who live below the poverty line. Forgive us for our lack of caring and sharing. God, we don't want to be uniform. So help us to use the gifts you have given us in the spirit in which they were given, to build your kingdom and your people. Amen. You may be seated. Now we'll have uh, a short video for uh, children's time uh, made by Risha. Hello everyone. Has anyone ever flipped through a newspaper? The newspaper often has reports of good news, 
bad news, sports, weather, stories, and so much more. It's a great way to keep up with what's happening in the world around us. The Bible is a lot like a newspaper. It gives us reports from moments in history and tells stories of things that happened a long time ago. What if we read our Bible lesson from today, like an article in a daily newspaper? Today's story is from the Gospel of John. The word gospel actually means good news, so let's imagine that we are reading an article from the Daily Galilean, or perhaps the Jerusalem Times. Wow, listen to this headline, Wedding Guest Turns Water Into Wine? That sounds really interesting. Let's read the rest of the story. According to this article, on Tuesday, a woman named Mary was in Cana to attend a wedding. A large number of guests, including her son, a man named Jesus, also attended the wedding. Guests at the wedding were reportedly having a good time until the host ran out of wine. At that rate, it seemed that the happy celebration might turn into a disaster. Some of the wedding guests thought that perhaps Jesus might have a solution to the problem, so they reported to him that they were out of wine. When told about the problem, Jesus at first seemed unwilling to do anything, but after some encouragement from his mother, he finally agreed to help. Eyewitnesses at the wedding reported that Jesus noticed several large water jugs nearby and instructed some servants to fill them with water. After the jars had been filled with water, he told them to dump some of the water out of the jars and take it to the man in charge of serving the wine. When the wine steward tasted the water, he discovered it had been turned into wine. Wedding guests were amazed at the turn of events and said that the wine was the best they ever tasted. As a result of the miraculous event, many people are following Jesus everywhere he goes, and many believe that he might even be the long-awaited Messiah. Well, that made a pretty good news story, didn't it? Do you know what is really great about the story, though? Just as Jesus performed a miracle by changing the water into wine at the wedding celebration more than 2,000 years ago, he is still working miracles in the hearts and lives of people today. If you let him, he will work a miracle in you. Dear Jesus, worker of miracles, work a miracle in us today. Amen. Thank you. Awesome job, Risha. <laughs> so welcome, welcome. Good morning. Welcome those who are worshiping, worshiping us um, with us here this morning and on Zoom uh, and on Facebook. Um, Pastor Nova, as you all know, um, is still on medical leave. She should be returning um, February 8th. Um, upon her return that Sunday, we're going to... Um, Try. Tentatively, I have a um, church council single board uh, reorganization meeting that will be held um, on Sunday, February 13th, after worship. Uh, we are still in need of liturgists and counters um, and children's time. I know it's hard to follow uh, Risha's great uh, videos, but don't be shy. <laughs> Uh, we still have uh, Wednesday's uh, ESL class at 7, uh, Friday's youth hangout. Um, we're going to still try to hold monthly. Um, let's see. Birthdays, January birthdays. Um, happy belated birthday to Jay on the 14th. Uh, Erish on the 15th. Little guy's birthday's today. Happy birthday, guy. He turned a uh, milestone today, 18 years old today. So or 18 years young, we'll say. Um, and Dale Sinkowitz, uh, who was like a second mom to me growing up at Springfield Emanuel's is uh, tomorrow. Um, Dijon Santos uh, is tomorrow as well. Um, we learned, um, I spoke with Evelyn Shenick and we learned that um, Jean Maurer, some of us um, from Springfield Emanuel may know, uh, Jean Maurer, um, uh, yeah, you know, Jean Maurer has passed away. She entered internal life October 31st, and she was, I believe, 91 years young. So uh, it's the new year. If you have any new prayer requests, please let us know. We'll enter them uh, onto the bulletin, and um, we will pray for them. Thank you. Oh, yes. Oh, Asha? Oh, you're not on here? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, so we get it from that main copy and never put it in. <laughs> 30 seconds. Okay, I will add that on there. Thank you, thank you. You have no cobwebs <coughs> out here. Wow, um, in 38 years of uh, full-time ministry, I think, Elmer, I missed maybe three or four Sundays because of a flu or something. So look what I did now. I just beat all, every record two weeks in a row. <laughs> I'm still whooped. I am so tired. That's the only real thing I have, thank God. I mean, people have a hundred times worse. So we're, again, going to go, I, every week I go on Holy Spirit power, but this is super Holy Spirit power this morning. So we'll get through and we'll do it victoriously. I want to tell you something before I, I pray. Um, this message I'm going to do today is one of my favorites. I've done it about 12 times in my churches over the years. But you say, 12 times? Yeah, actually, I did this for the first time. 42 years ago, almost to the day. It was January 20th, 1980. I had only been in ministry three years at the time. That's why I can't remember where I got all this stuff from. I picked from here and there and put everything together. Um, <laughs> that's astounding. Um, it's almost like 44, uh, 42 years ago, something like that. <laughs> So, but people have loved this message because it really encourages. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, and hopefully it'll be uh, an encouraging message for you uh, as well. I want to thank each one of you being here, first of all, during this crazy uh, time where so much sickness is going around uh, and it's, it really is cold out. Um, those of you, there's, there's many of our other folks, as you know, would like to be here, either they're under the weather or they're, they're a little concerned about the, the COVID situation. And we understand, we understand. We wish you could be here. But the seats are filled, the rest of the seats are filled with the angels of God. So we got a full house this morning. All right, so hopefully we'll, we'll uh, pray and preach accordingly. Okay, let's pray. Wonderful and gracious Heavenly Father, it, it just amazes me, our lives. Um, just the other day, I was a young man starting ministry, <laughs> and here I am 45 years later, still standing by your grace. Um, and I thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing each of us, many of us, through uh, various illnesses uh, during this season and throughout our lives because we've all been on the bed of affliction at, from time to time. Uh, we pray for so many others who are ill this morning, not just our own people, but people everywhere. Uh, and we pray for uh, your continued healing grace. Uh, you did not cause this. We brought this on ourselves and a long, long way around at any rate. Uh, but we thank you, uh, Lord, that even though we mess up, uh, you work to heal us and put us back on our feet again, not just uh, physically, but emotionally, spiritually, socially, in every way. Uh, Lord, bless our nation, uh, our leaders, help them to take a step back and look at what is it that the Lord would want us to do in, uh, in running this country. Uh, Lord, we thank you this morning for these amazing ministries that are making such a powerful difference in the world. Uh, in, in my hand at this moment, I have Samaritan's Purse, uh, an amazing ministry that digs wells in Africa for people who have dirty water. Um, they, now they have clean water um, and shares the gospel wherever there's a disaster, uh, the mess in Kentucky and uh, surrounding states. We continue to pray for those folks. We thank you Samaritan's Purse is there. Um, and other Christian organizations. Uh, we thank you for the, the Jesus film that is sharing the good news of the gospel all over the world. And new churches are popping up all over the place. And, um, and, and this organization helps then organize um, new churches. Um, and 
people are coming, even witch doctors and people who have done despicable things in the lives of others, have become believers in Jesus, received uh, forgiveness, healing, and in some cases, they become the pastor of the church. Well, just God's grace is so amazing. Um, Lord, we think of uh, Salvation Army. Some of us rang the bell uh, last month, and what a wonderful experience that is. And um, Salvation Army has helped uh, so, so many people over the years. Um, it's uh, 150, I think, six years old now. Uh, thank you for raising up that ministry and so many others uh, that we have the privilege of supporting through our prayers and our, our gifts and even service in some uh, instances. So Lord, bless these ministries. Bless the church, the, the, the churches all over the world who locally, um, as well as uh, missionally, uh, reaching out to people in need. Lord, thank you for, for your loving care and graciousness. Us human beings, are, it's so easy for us to go astray, to treat each other poorly, to, to vie for power, and play all kinds of games with people's lives. Lord, it's, it's easy to do that. But we thank you, Lord, that as your spirit lives in us, you teach us, no, there's, there's a better way to go. And you want us to live humbly, in power, but humbly, uh, through the Holy Spirit in our lives, walking with you. You've given us the greatest uh, teachings, the greatest word as to how to live in this world. Help us to, to continue every day to read what you have to say. And then, by your grace and your power, to live out what you've told us to do. Thank you, Lord. Lord, uh, be with us in this service. Help me to speak in a way that will bless all of us this morning and will bring glory, honor, and praise to you. And we'll give you the thanks and praise for that. In Jesus' name. And Lord, a, a P.S. prayer, as my mom used to say, we continue to pray for Pastor Nova. Um, she and, uh, well, three-fourths of her family have had the, this, uh, this latest uh, version of the, of the COVID problem. Um, and they have, uh, they've come through it and are continuing to heal. But especially uh, touch Pastor Nova Thank you that there's some healing. We pray that that will continue to unfold and we'll, get, we'll go along even more rapidly as the days go on. We, we'd love to see her back um, sharing the good news with us again. So lift her up. Thank you, Lord, for all that you continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please pray with me the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Please rise for the scripture lesson taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 18. I apologize, I don't think we have it um, available uh, on the video. But it's short, so it's easy to follow. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who are hard among you, who are work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Okay, so this morning, we're going to talk about on kissing frogs. So, uh, have any of you kissed a frog lately? No? Why? This is the church. We should be kissing frogs. What's the matter with us? <laughs> all right, we'll find out what that's all about in just a minute. Let's, let's have a, just a short word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Lord, we, we thank you and praise you for this 
what seems like a wacky message, which may be one of the greatest messages that you've uh, allowed me to ever share. Uh, so we, we thank you for it, and may it uh, touch our hearts and draw us closer to you and to one another. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so there was a guy named Wes Selinger, um, and he's a writer, and he took uh, one of those ancient fairy tales, which you all know, and he wrote, uh, wrote it in his own words, and it goes like this. A fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a frog. But he really wasn't a frog. He was a prince who looked and felt like a frog. A wicked witch had cast a spell on him. Only the kiss of a beautiful young maiden could save him. But since when do cute chicks kiss frogs? So there he sat, unkissed prince in frog form. But miracles do happen. One day a beautiful maiden grabbed him up and gave him a big smack. Crash, boom, zap, there he was, a handsome prince, and you know the rest of the story. They lived happily ever after. So we laugh at this fairy tale, it's very cute. But it does contain a very, very important message for the church. It agrees with God's word in defining for us the task of the church. It, beside worshiping God and glorifying him, number one, the second most important thing, task of the church is to kiss frogs. What? That's right. There are lots of frogs out there all over the place. There are You don't have to go very far to find a frog. In fact, we might have some frogs sitting here in this service this morning. Who, what, a frog? Yes, these are people who are very unhappy in life. Unfulfilled, down on themselves, and feeling unlovely. Every one, every day, you can meet a person who would be qualified in these terms as a frog. You can tell by the countenance, their, their, their facial expressions. It gives them away. They're not very happy with life. Life for them has not really been a good experience. I can say I've had a remarkable life. I've had my ups and downs like you. But overall, <laughs> Melissa, I've had a really good life. And I'm very thankful that God called me to, to do what, he, what I'm doing. And I, I'm fulfilled. I'm a, a person full of joy, uh, even in difficult times. I have a good life. I've had a couple of people kiss me when I was a frog. As followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be kissing frogs and turning them into a prince or a princess in the kingdom of God. Now I look at this on two levels. One is evangelism. Loving people by our actions, words, and attitudes into the kingdom. Sharing the good news, the best news that has ever come to humankind, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Or I can, I can write, say it this way, but God shows his love for us in that while we were yet frogs, sinners, Christ died for us. Does that make sense? Ah, but let's realize that there are many frogs even in the church. Now well, sometimes you may feel like a frog for a, a couple of weeks. You're going through a tough time. Everything is just not going well in your life. And you're down or maybe you don't feel well. And you just feel like a frog. And that's when we need to get alongside one another and kiss one another, encourage one another. Um, when a person feels unloved, unwanted, undesirable for whatever reasons, we need to come alongside and encourage our brothers and sisters. So sometimes even in the church, there's frogs. Sometimes it's only for, hopefully, for a short period of time, and we help that brother or sister get through that, that phase, that thing that they're going through. When we feel like a frog, we need somebody to come and kiss us and encourage us during that time. When we see someone who feels like a frog then, 
let's come alongside them and give them a kiss. Okay, but Wes Selinger isn't done with us yet. He's got another little portion to this fairy tale this morning. Ever feel like a frog? Frogs feel slow, low, ugly, puffy, drooped, pooped. I know, one told me. The frog feeling comes when you want to be bright, but you feel dull. You want to share, but you're selfish. You want to be thankful, but you feel resentment. You want to be big, but you're small. You want to care, but you're indifferent. Yes, at one time or another, each of us has found himself on the lily pad floating down the river of life, frightened and disgusted and too froggish to budge. Ever feel that way? <laughs> of course, all of us many times have felt this way, and it's part of the human condition, isn't it? I can remember a girl in second grade. Her name was Jacqueline Clark. And this, this story breaks my heart. Jacqueline Clark had no friends. Her clothes were soiled and wrinkled. Her hair was matted sometimes. She didn't smell very good. She was, didn't look very pretty. I'm sure if she had had a complete makeover, she would be very pretty. But. And some of the girls in the class uh, ganged up on her. They called her Cootie. Some of them called her a witch. Now what did that do to that girl's self-image? Now I was a, a dumb little second grade boy. I wasn't a Christian at the time. To this day I wish that I had stood up for her. I didn't add to her misery, but I didn't do anything to help her. Bob Woods, I wish he was here this morning. He and I, when I first got back to Kenilworth six years ago, we were trying to find her after 50 years. Now, how many Jacqueline Clarks are there in the world? And maybe she, she got married and has a different name. But we were even looking to see if there was something that we could do to say we were sorry for the way she was treated. If she needed financial help, we were willing to do that, whatever it would take to, to make her life better if it wasn't good. Maybe she was able to rise above all of this awful treatment. The, the child didn't do anything that should have deserved this. When I researched it, I'm like a detective. I know how to research things out sometimes. And I found out that there was a family that attended this church in its early days when it was on the other side of town on the North 20th Street. And that family was instrumental in trying to help Jacqueline's family. You see, Jacqueline came, she was the oldest of five kids, and there was a mom. The dad, I don't know whether he died, he left the house, what, what happened? And this woman had no in, hardly any income. So this family in this church was bringing food to them on a week, weekly basis. And I'm still friends with the oldest son, who is like uh, 75 years old now, who tells me the story. So I'm glad that at least somebody stood up and tried to kiss the, these poor frogs, these people who were down and out and just had nobody there to help them. Now I want to tell you about another frog. This one everybody knows. As soon as I say his name, you'll know who I'm talking about. One of the most famous people in all of history, but one of the most infamous people. His name, first name was Adolf. Can you tell me what the last name is? Adolf Hitler. At a point in his life, he was a frog, very angry inside. He did not feel positive about life, society, or even himself. He desperately needed to be loved at a younger age. I believe he didn't receive the love he needed, like, the, like any of us need. And somehow, somewhere along the line, as the story goes, he was rejected by some Jewish people, and. That was part of his absolute hatred for those people. Of course, behind the scenes, I believe Satan inspired him to destroy the Jewish people. And he repaid the Jewish people and, and everybody else a, a hundred thousand times over. How many people died as a result of World War II and the concentration camps and all that awful stuff that happened? Now, here's a question. What would have happened 
if when he was a young boy and he needed love, if someone, someone who loved Jesus came alongside of him and showed interest in him and loved him, he may have rejected it, but maybe not. What would have happened? Would maybe not things have turned out a little differently? Adolf Hitler, I think we've all heard some of a little excerpts of his speeches. JV, you've heard. Was he not a powerful speaker? Man, people, they just, they were amazed by his rhetoric. A master orator. Imagine if he had become a Christian. He would have been the Billy Graham of his time. How many millions of people would have been swept into the kingdom of the living God instead of killed in a gas chamber? What would have happened differently if this frog had been kissed when he really needed it in his life? We might have had revival instead of a holocaust. You see? See the difference? You can, I mean, this is one little boy. What difference does he make? Look at the difference he made. Only it was a bad one. There's stories of, um, I, I'm not, I, I don't have this in my notes, but of, of people who were just a little 10-year-old boy, girl, insignificant, and they turned out to be one of the greatest missionaries that uh, the church has ever seen. <laughs> So don't ever count anybody out, and especially a young person who needs to be loved, we gotta be there for them. Hatred begets hatred, but love begets love. Amen, amen? Only Jesus knows how each of us can kiss a frog. He's given each of us different talents and abilities and ways of doing that. And we can turn somebody else's life around. Now, I, uh, my wife and I went on a marriage enrichment meeting in Owego, New York, oh gosh, 35 years ago maybe. And we, we saw a, a film, uh, and it was the most, one of the most remarkable films I've ever seen. The setting was in Hawaii, and it was the story of Johnny Lingo. It's a true life story. There was a very handsome bachelor named Johnny Lingo. He's, he was well off financially. And the girls, when he went by, oh, <laughs> he swooned, you know, he, he was a 10. All the girls dreamed that maybe he would choose them to be his wife. One day, he got into the marketplace and they all came out to listen. He says, I have an announcement to make. He said, um, Today I'm going to announce who I would like to, uh, who I choose and would like to marry. Every, all the girls went, <sighs> holding their breath, hoping that he would say their name. He said, I wish to marry Mahana. Tomorrow I will talk with her father and we will seal the marriage contract. And all the girls went, what? What? Mahana? What, what is he, crazy? She's ugly. Why would he choose her? Why not me? Why did he choose her? All the pretty girls around here, why, why Mahana? Now the custom was for the groom to come to the father of the bride-to-be, and he would uh, offer uh, cows. <laughs> cows are very, were a very important commodity. Right? The more cows you offered, the more wealth you were offering. Now, the number of cows that most uh, young men could offer would be one, maybe two. Once in a blue, blue moon, three or four. But that was out of this world. Five was absolutely unthinkable, unheard of. The next day, the father mocked his daughter, Mahana. You're so ugly, he said. I can't believe that, that this man or any man would want to marry you. I thought I'd be stuck with an ugly daughter all my life, and the poor girl, she was weeping, and she climbed way up in this tree to get away from him. Later that day, Johnny Lingo came to her father to speak with him. Everyone guessed, well, maybe he'll offer one, one cow for her at best. They were all absolutely astounded and shocked when he offered eight cows eight cows for her. 
Unbelievable. So they got married, and they went away, and he was able to afford it, and they were gone three, four, five months. That big honeymoon. And they came back, and the people were just absolutely amazed. They said, what happened? Is this really Mahana? She's so beautiful. His great love, his unconditional love had turned her from a frog into a beautiful, fulfilled, be lovely woman, young woman. I have a saying that I, I think I made up. I hope I did. I don't think there's too many things more beautiful in the world than a woman who knows she's loved. One man said to Johnny Lingo, what happened? She became beautiful. And Johnny Lingo said, no, she's always been beautiful. I loved her since her childhood. He looked at her the way Jesus Christ looks at us. Some of us are a mess. But he looks at us for what we can be in him. Because he's got a plan for every one of us in this world. We should never say about another person, well, he's a piece of garbage. We feel that way sometimes, the way people act and they do, just do despicable, horrible things. But in Christ, think of what that person could be. Outside of Christ, if you or I were outside of Christ, ugh, we wouldn't be so hot either. I shudder to think what I would be without Jesus Christ. You know, John Wesley said, without Jesus Christ, without the power of the Holy Spirit, I would be as bad as the worst devil in hell. And he was right. We need Christ. And other people need Christ. We have the answer. We have Jesus in our lives. We need to share that with other people. That's what the scripture is teaching us today. So I like to spend the, the balance of the time going over three different groups of people that the scripture kind of talks about here. Uh, Melissa beautifully read for us this morning. Um, one is admonish the idlers. In other words, disorderly people, idle people. Uh, King James says unruly people. Um, people with too much time on their hands. People who have no rhyme or reason in their lives. People who feel worthless, apathetic, poor self-image. There's people all over this world that are like this. They don't want to work. They're lazy. They waste time. If they're youth, they like to cut school. They take no pride in themselves. They're not trying to improve. They're in a rut. Now, this is not to be judgmental of, of these folks. I'm just giving a description. The temptation is to judge them. What's the matter with them? Give them. Well, maybe they need somebody to come alongside of them and give them a kiss, give them a, a, little, a little love. Christ died for them as well as he did for us. They are just as precious to him as you and I are. He doesn't want to see them stay in that situation. He doesn't want their lives to be in rack and ruin. He wants them to be lifted up out of that. Who knows? But you might know somebody like this. I, I've had people in my life that I've really tried to, to go the extra mile to try to lift them out of their, the mess that they found. In many cases, it wasn't even their fault, what their parents did to them. Jesus looks at people for what they can be in him. And he looks beyond our froggishness and he sees a prince or a princess. So reach out to the idlers, encourage them to go in the right direction. One way to get a fire in a person's life, of course, is to introduce them to Jesus because he's working on people all the time in the Holy Spirit, even if we're not around. But he can use us to make a difference as well. The Holy Spirit gets in a person's life and makes a powerful difference. So we want to love people into wholeness, help them, uh, create in them a desire to do better. If you see a person who doesn't have much going for them, but they do one thing well, jump on that. Accentuate the positive. Tell them, oh, you're doing a great job. Well, oh, you're so talented. I mean, but tell them the truth. But if they're really doing something well, accentuate that. That lifts a person up. Next thing you know, maybe they want to do one other thing well. And that's what sometimes helps people get out of this terrible froggishness, if you will. Okay, the second group is the timid. 
Encourage the faint-hearted or the feeble-minded, as it says in King James. Those who have been upset by life. Maybe they've had just one bad thing after another happen. They're paralyzed by fear. They have had many troubles in life and they're just overwhelmed. We've all felt overwhelmed from time to time, but maybe we've been able to rise above it. But there's people that just can't seem to get, it's like they have a dark cloud uh, back over their heads, their whole lives. Every time they turn around, now what, you know? They need comfort, they need to, some soothing, they need someone to cheer them on. Someone to give them hope. If you have hope, you can be in horrible situations. If you have hope, you can get through that. If you're going to despair, you're in trouble. You're not going to survive. There were, I don't know how many times, I did over 20,000 pastoral calls in my life. That wasn't a, a job to me, Elaine. That wasn't a job. I loved my people, and I loved being with them. I went to the, I don't know how many thousand times I've been in nursing homes and in hospitals, especially when people were facing major surgery in the next day. Sometimes I'd go in there and they were so low. They were so scared. And I would do everything I knew to do, in prayer and scripture and uh, everything I could to lift them up and, and give them some hope that they have a really good surgeon who's going to do a good job God will guide their hand and the Lord will be with you. And in the many cases where we were able to lift that person up and give them hope, they came out of that surgery much faster. Doctors were like, wow, this person's recuperating faster. Wow. And they were really amazed by it. Not, not anything I really did, I was just the instrument. God did the work. I just told them, just put a, pointed them in the right direction or reminded them that, that God undertakes for us and helps us. One Sunday afternoon, my family, my two girls, wife, mother and father, in the Jackson area of New Jersey, we had been to a wonderful worship service. We went to this diner that we loved to go to. We had been there many times. It was always a great time. We were very happy because we, the service was good. It was a beautiful day. We were all together. And I looked over, and I saw this elderly man sitting by himself. And he was weeping. His dinner was right in front of him. He couldn't even eat. I said to the family, look, I, I, I can't sit here and let, let that man just sit there like this. So I got up, and I went over, and I sat there, and I said, sir, what, what's wrong? Is there anything I can do to help you? He said, for years, my wife and I have come here. And we love this place, and we've come here to eat dinner together. And last week, she died. I'm all by myself. And just the fact that I, somebody came and just sat there with, her, with him for a few minutes and just tried to talk soothing and comforting words it helped him. He was able to start to eat and take a deep breath and, and, and made his day a little better anyway. Sometimes that's all you can do, guys. Jesus was a master at this because he loves everybody. Everybody else, leper, leper, you run the other direction. Jesus runs toward the person. How many lepers did he heal? The frogs of society, the outcasts, socially, physically, spiritually, in every way, they were shunned. They had to live in their own community. Get away from us. We don't want. Jesus went towards them, and he brought healing to them at every level. He loves to make people who are lepers a prince or a princess in his kingdom. The third and final group, help the weak. Now, this doesn't necessarily uh, a shock mean uh, somebody physic physically uh, um, weak. It can mean somebody weak in judgment. They don't make very good decisions. A deficiency or a lack of knowledge or faith. Uh, weak in faith if they're kind of a believer. And they can fall, a person, we can all fall into sin very easily. Even strong believers can. But somebody that doesn't have conviction in their life or maybe the Lord to help them 
can fall into sin so easily. Again, let's not, we, we ought not judge or condemn. So what's the matter with them? You know, the old saying, um, if it were, was not for the grace of God, there go I. That's more accurate. We need to try to take a person like that, if they'll, if they'll allow us, by the hand of the arm and try to move them in a more positive direction. You all know the story of Jesus teaching in the temple. A woman was caught in adultery in the Gospel of John. Where the guy was, I mean, why wasn't he condemned too? But now the, just a woman was brought in and thrown, thrown down at Jesus' feet. She committed adultery and the law says she should be stoned to death. And what did Jesus say? Yes, that's right, she should be stoned to death. Get the stones out, come on, or we're going to send her to hell. This is what you get for committing adultery. Is that what he said? No. No, he just was writing in the sand, I think, peeking around the scriptures, that he was writing the names of her accusers in the sand there and their worst sin. He said, well, okay, yeah, the law says stoner. Um, those of you who um, have committed no sin, you throw the first stone. And can you just picture it? You can just hear it. You hear one of these large stones hit the pavement and the guy walk out. And then another one walk out and they all drop their stones because they all had skeletons in the closet. They all, none of them lived perfectly up to the law. And they dropped their stones and walked out. Jesus looked up. He knew the answer, but he said, where did your accusers go? <laughs> he wasn't surprised. He knew this was going to happen. <laughs> and then he said to her, go and sin no more. He didn't put a rubber stamp on it. Oh, it's okay if you did. No. He said, you did wrong. But go and don't do it anymore. I bet you that woman got up and lived a totally different life. Don't you think so? Amen? Be patient with them all. Bear with people in general. Give them the benefit of the doubt. I have done this my whole life. Sometimes I get egg on my face because they take advantage of me. I'm too nice, I'm told. But I'd rather err on that side than to be harsh. If a person's wayward, they have no faith in God, they could care less. They could even be abusive, could even mock you for your faith. You may get somebody like that. Don't, get, don't return vitriol for vitriol. Turn the other cheek. Pray in your heart to, to forgive them and, and to do whatever you can to bless them. Because if they had Christ in their hearts, they wouldn't treat you that way. They would act differently. Amen? So here's our call to Christian discipleship. Brothers and sisters, we got lots of work to do, don't we? Yeah, we got frogs to kiss. <laughs> and once in a while, we get to be a frog, and then we want somebody to come kiss us. But no, we, we know Jesus. We love Jesus. We, we want to bring people to Jesus and furthermore help them, encourage them in that new faith. We want to turn a frog into a prince or a princess. We're the instruments. God works through us to get that done. That's, that makes all of us pretty important in, in the eyes of the Lord. I, you know, I could do a two-hour message right now. I've been reading all these biographies of, of uh, Christian missionaries. I'm reading about this woman. I'll take real quick, one, one more minute. Her name is Gladys. She was a housekeeper. She had hardly any education. She was brought up in England. She was born around 1900. The missionary society flunked her out because she, she didn't pass her, her, her Bible classes. They wouldn't support her. She felt called to China. So she worked her tail off as a housekeeper, made enough 47 pounds, paid the money, went on trains all through Europe, Russia, Siberia, and China, almost got killed several times. Five feet tall, that's all she was. No missionary society backing her. No money when she got there. And the, the, the story is like five times crazier than what I'm telling you. 
And it turns out that, that God used this woman to turn people's lives around like you, you wouldn't believe. I wish I, maybe I could tell you the story sometime. But <sighs> so every one of us is important in the eyes of the Lord. He's got work for us to do. How exciting that is. That should put a bounce on our step alone. Not just having Jesus, that's a bounce on the step, but the fact that you and I are important in God's sight. Lord, thank you and praise you. How in the world did you choose me to do this? Because I was a nobody. And you have made somebody of me. I know I've been a frog. And you've kissed me and you've made me into a prince. And these brothers and sisters, they've had their tough times as well. And you have turned each one of us into a prince or a princess. And now, now you've, got, you've got work for us to do. So help us, Lord. Help us to be, have our spiritual antennas up. Help us to hear you say, there's a frog Monday morning. There's a frog. There's a person that needs help. And give us the, the power in your spirit, the love in your spirit to touch that frog whatever way we can. For the sake of the kingdom and the glory of your name we pray. Jesus, O oh Lord, amen. Lord, we come to you today to honor you in your house as we present our tithes and offerings to you. The congregation is um, welcome to bring their tithes and offerings to the altar at this time. rise for the doxology. join me in the offertory prayer. Generous God, we are reminded through scripture of the spiritual gifts that you give. We know that these are not for us to hold on to, but are gifts for us to share. Gifts from you meant for giving. As we offer our tithes and offerings, prompt us to commit more than dollars, but to see the gifts you have written on our hearts and to share generously of these as well. We pray these words in the name of Jesus, in whose way we follow, for whose love we are eternally grateful. Amen. Let's remain standing for our closing hymn, I Stand Amazed in the Presence, found in the United Methodist Hymnal 371.
you hear <coughs> this benediction. I'm taking it from, uh, from Jude, one verse. And now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Arise and go in peace, dear brothers.